All right, let's open our Bibles to the book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah chapter 13. We finally got to chapter 13. We started this back in January, I believe. Had to miss several Wednesdays because of my medical treatments, but here we are back again. We made it to chapter 13. We'll go as far as we can go this evening. And let me start by reading the first three verses there, Nehemiah 13. Well, let me back up and read the last verse of chapter 12. And all Israel in the days of Zerubbabel and in the days of Nehemiah gave the portions of the singers and the porters every day his portion. And they sanctified holy things unto the Levites, and the Levites sanctified them unto the children of Aaron. On that day they read in the book of Moses in the audience of the people, and therein was found written that the Ammonite and the Moabite should not come into the congregation of God forever, because they met not the children of Israel with bread and with water, but hired Balaam against them, that he should curse them, howbeit our God turned the curse into a blessing. Now it came to pass, when they had heard the law, that they separated from Israel all of all the mixed multitude. Stop there for a little bit. This is similar to previous parts, uh, previous sections in Nehemiah, that the people have intermingled with non-Jewish cultures, non-Jewish people. And part of the result uh, of that very often is the loss of your mother tongue. Look down at verses 23 and 24. In those days also saw I Jews that had married wives of Ashdod, of Ammon, and of Moab. And their children spake half in the speech of Ashdod, and could not speak in the Jews' language, but according to the language of each people. The expression multicultured really means that you destroy one existing culture, one existing society, um, by mixing it with another. Uh, it's called, uh, when you mix things that aren't normally mixed together, it's called adulterating, watering down the content of something. And uh, the Bible says, a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. And the reference to Moab and Ammon was first found back in Deuteronomy 23, if you want to run back there for just a moment, Deuteronomy 23, and verses 3 and 4, an Ammonite or a Moabite shall not enter into the congregation of the Lord, even to their tenth generation shall they not enter into the congregation of the Lord forever. Because they met you not with bread and with water in the way when ye came forth out of Egypt, and because they hired against thee Balaam, the son of Beor, of Pethor, of Mesopotamia, to curse thee. And uh, Balak, the king of Moab, hired uh, Balaam uh, to curse Israel. Come take a look at how rotten they are. Take a look at how many they are. Take a look at what uh, threat they may be. And... Uh, offer some curse. Balaam was uh, a uh, prophet at the time. And uh, he, but of course, Balak said he had promoted him to great honor and riches if he did so. And Balaam said, I can only say what the Lord tells me to say. And he couldn't curse Israel. But he rather, in the end, he rather intimated, that is to imply or to suggest, without saying in so many words, that Israel could bring a curse on themselves if they would marry, intermarry with peoples that didn't belong to them. They'd water down the bloodlines of the tribes, and uh, that's something God had commanded against. Uh, the 12 tribes were to uh, keep themselves uh, separate from each other, never mind mixing with the uh, Gentile, the heathen nations. Um, Moab and Ammon were the sons of Lot with his two daughters. You call that story in Genesis 19. They got their father drunk and um, 
fornicated with him, and he must have been pretty drunk not realizing what's going on with his own daughters. And uh, they were both with child by their own father, and they became the uh, two sons, Moab and Ammon, and the father of those nations, which later on became enemies to the nation of Israel. And uh, so the, uh, it's a, his daughters, if Lot uh, vexed himself with a filthy conversation of the wicked, it's most likely his own daughters were mixed with, between uh, himself and uh, the people of Sodom. But um, Balaam couldn't curse Israel for Balak, the Moabite. God prevented him. And like I said, he, he led Balak to get his people to entice the children of Israel to commit fornication mixed with them, um, tainting the, the Hebrew bloodlines, causing Israel to bring a curse upon themselves. Uh, look back, if you will, at Exodus chapter 12. Just a minute. Exodus 12. Verses uh, 37 and 38. <clears throat> Exodus 12, verses 37 and 38. And the children of Israel journeyed from Ramses to Sukkoth, about 600,000 on foot that were men beside children. And a mixed multitude went up also with them, and flocks and herds, even very much cattle. They were all Egyptians who latched on to Israel as they were exiting, uh, leaving Egypt, the Exodus. C.I. Schofield had a good note on this sort of thing in the old Schofield Reference Bible. He said, quote, This mixed multitude, standing for unconverted church members, was a source of weakness and division, then as now. And that's a great spiritual uh, lesson to be drawn from that. If someone wants to join your church. It's, it's fair for the church members to ask that potential new, new member uh, to agree with the statement of faith, the things that the church holds to and has convictions about. And if and we don't go that far, we're very, very loose. We don't have a, a test or a questionnaire to ask people to agree to before they come. Once they come and realize we believe the King James Bible from cover to cover, <laughs> pretty soon they, they, they get tired and they go somewhere else. But it's fine. Let them go somewhere else. But, uh, but if a church has certain uh, doctrines, certain statements, di uh, distinctives, they want to stand by, then it's fair to expect someone who wants to join them to understand what they're getting themselves into. I don't want to force somebody else to make a mistake, and uh, certainly would be a mistake to uh, let someone join who didn't fully agree and identify with the convictions that the, the church, the congregation, uh, already has established. And uh, whether it's mixing races, which is... Uh, in, the, in the New Testament, there's a lot of grace. I tell you, there's a lot of grace to cover things that God would have commanded against in the Old Testament. And there in the New Testament, there are no hard and fast rules about that. But sometimes there are practical lessons to be learned about not doing it. And whether it's, whether it's mixing ethnicities, races, or uh, some sort of ecumenical, all the churches get together, uh, promise keepers type thing, um, or some charismatic ecumenical thing where the where the Charismatics and the Catholics who speak to pray to Mary in tongues are going to get together and try to have fellowship. It never works. All you end up doing is destroying any distinctives that you might have had uh, and give way to the other group and them to you. And um, we, in marriages, we, we say what God has joined together, let no man put asunder or divide. Well, what if you turn that... <clears throat> around and said, what God hath divided, let no man join together. And like I said, I have to be qualify that by saying there's a lot of grace in the New Testament. What are you going to do with some couple that um, they say they have a mixed family, mixed marriage, and then they get saved. They want to do something for the Lord. The grace of Jesus Christ covers whatever they've done in the past, 
covers whatever sins they've committed, covers whatever crimes they committed, uh, and God forgives. And God says, I can still use you. You know how um, the Apostle Paul took uh, Timothy to be uh, his disciple. Timothy was mixed. His mother was a Jew. His father was a Greek. And um, most of the Jews would not want him entering into the synagogues or into the temple. And Paul had him to be circumcised uh, as a testimony to show that, hey, I'm identifying with the God of the Hebrews as Paul's preaching him. And uh, God said, I can use him. He's willing to do something for the Lord. And God says, I can use him. So the grace that God extends uh, in situations like that is unbelievable. Now, in some cases, I'd say there is no excuse for trying to mix a Bible-believing Baptist with some uh, modern Presbyterian or Lutheran. There's no excuse for that. You ought to have better sense than that. But, <laughs> but the other issues, God has a tremendous amount of grace. I'm glad he had grace to me, with, with me. And um, I'm glad being a Gentile, I still got in on the salvation that, that the Jewish Son of God uh, effected for my soul. And uh, thank the Lord for that. But um, <clears throat> uh, once you take the positive view of integration, whether it's ecumenical religious mixing, um, tolerating everything, uh, you lose whatever identity you had and once upon a time stood for. I was telling somebody, it might have been Brother Lee, we were talking about this one time. Um, <laughs> go back 60 years, 1959, 60, long in there. Virtually every Baptist of every stripe, every Pentecostal of every stripe, of every Lutheran, every Methodist, every Presbyterian, every Nazarene, every uh, Congregationalist, and all the rest. Every single one of those churches believed that the King James Bible was the Word of God. They didn't preface, their ministers didn't preface their remarks by saying, now the Greek word says this, or the Hebrew word means that, or in the Aramaic it meant such and such and this and that and the other. Nobody talked that way. They didn't talk that way. Now they might have interpreted verses a hundred different ways, but this was the book they were interpreting. This was the book they believed. And uh, one by one, all of those denominations and most of the Baptist groups uh, over the last 60 years have adopted some new version, some new, and uh, they no longer believe. Those of us who still believe that this book is the word of God, somehow we're the heretics? No, oh, they're the heretics. I believe all of them are the heretics. They, they, they've abandoned the position they once held. And, uh, and I can drive you around within 20 miles of our church right here. I can show you a former Southern Baptist church that is now a Thai Buddhist temple. I can show you some Pentecostal churches that are now uh, Chinese and Vietnamese Buddhist temples. I can show you a, a, a former Methodist church that's now a Buddhist temple. And uh, it's just, once you have no authority, why, you, why do you even exist? It's kind of, once you have no absolute authority that says, this is the book we're going to go by. This is the book we're going to believe. And um, either get on board or get out. <laughs> then, then, then if not, then why do you even exist? But um, 2 Corinthians 4, now it doesn't make you very popular. But 2 Corinthians 4.18 says, While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Yeah. Dr. Ruckman used to pose this question. Wouldn't, it, wouldn't someone fare better at the judgment seat of Christ if they, believed, if they believed this book was the word of God and turns out that it wasn't? Wouldn't they still fare better than someone who didn't believe it was the word of God, and turns out it is. <laughs> I think the first person would do would be in better shape for having believed it from cover to cover. And then that way, because then you put the onus, you put the responsibility on God. Why'd you give it to us if it wasn't your word? And um, <coughs> But uh, you don't want to do that with the truth of the word of God. You don't, um, you avoid doing it uh, with anything else. 
don't sacrifice the eternal on the altar of the immediate. Well, this modern version is more popular. This one's getting a lot of traction right now. That doesn't matter. Nehemiah uh, chapter 13. And let's continue. I'll read verses 4 through 9. And before this, Eliashib the priest, having the oversight of the chamber of the house of our God, was allied unto Tobiah. And he had prepared for him a great chamber, where aforetime they laid the meat offerings, the frankincense, and the vessels, and the tithes of the corn, the new wine, and the oil, which was commanded to be given to the Levites, and the singers, and the porters, and the offerings of the priests. But in all this time was not I at Jerusalem, for in the two and thirtieth year of Artaxerxes, king of Babylon, came I unto the king, and after certain days obtained I leave of the king. And I came to Jerusalem and understood of the evil that Eliashib did for Tobiah in preparing him a chamber in the courts of the house of God. And it grieved me sore, therein I cast forth all the household stuff of Tobiah out of the chamber. Then I commanded, and they cleansed the chambers, and thither brought I again the vessels of the house of God with the meat offering and the frankincense. Here's another close uh, acquaintance or a relative of Tobiah, uh, who had already tried to intimidate uh, Nehemiah against the restoration, the rebuilding of the temple wall and everything that was broken down. Look back at chapter 6 for just a moment. Go back a couple pages to chapter 6. Chapter 6, verses 17 through 19. Moreover, in those days, the nobles of Judah sent many letters unto Tobiah, and the letters of Tobiah came unto them. For there were many in Judah sworn unto him, because he was the son-in-law of Shechaniah, the son of Era, and his son, Johanan, had taken the daughter of Meshulam, the son of Berechiah. Also they reported his good deeds before me, and uttered my words to him, and Tobiah sent letters to put me in fear. So the people praised this guy and tried to impress Nehemiah with this guy's uh, acts, and Nehemiah seemed to be able to see through his act. He's trying to get leverage and control of the people and prevent the rebuilding. He's got a good thing going here for himself. Now Eliashib is a Levite priest, but he's buddied up with uh, Tobiah, who was one of Nehemiah's enemies, and he's given him special favors. Look at verse 7 of chapter 13 again. And I came to Jerusalem and understood of the evil that Eliashib did for Tobiah in preparing him a chamber in the courts of the house of God. <clears throat> um, so that Tobiah uh, could live off the offerings that people brought to, to the house of God, uh, to the Levites, although he was not a Levite. And Tobiah had converted the sacred chambers where the vessels of God were kept, according to verse 9, into a nice, neat little apartment for himself where he could entertain his friends, I suppose. And the contents of the chamber should have been the tithe the people gave to God, but instead, uh, the Bible says, Malachi 3.10, bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse. That's what these chambers would have been. But instead, now it was full of Tobiah's furniture. It was called his household stuff, there in verse 8. And it grieved me sore, therefore I cast forth all the household stuff of Tobiah out of the chamber. We continue from verses 10 uh, to 14. <clears throat> And I perceived that the portions of the Levites had not been given them, for the Levites and the singers that did the work were fled every one to his field. Then contended I with the rulers and said, Why is the house of God forsaken? And I gathered them together and set them in their place. Then brought all Judah the tithe of the corn and the new wine and the oil unto the treasuries. And I made treasures, treasurers over the treasuries, Shalemiah the priest and Zadok the scribe, and of the Levites, Pedaiah, and next to them was Hanan, the son of Zachor, the son of Mataniah, for they were accounted faithful, and their office was to distribute unto their brethren. Remember me, O my God, concerning this, and wipe not out my good deeds that I have done for the house of my God and for the offices thereof. There, verse 14, just briefly. 
uh, that you'll, you'll notice a um, very simple uh, confirmation that someone's righteousness was measured by the degree of their obedience and their faithfulness to the things of God in the Old Testament. You and I uh, receive the righteousness of Christ by faith. Um, it has nothing to do with how good you are, how good you've been, how much good you're going to do in the future. When you trust Christ as a sinner who needs to be forgiven by God and trust him and his death on Calvary alone to cover the guilt of your sin, you receive the righteousness of Christ. God now sees you covered with the righteousness of his own son. It had nothing to do, for by grace you saved through faith, right? Uh, and that not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. God now sees you as righteous, but here, Nehemiah was mindful that uh, his good deeds needed to be, uh, God needed to keep a record of his good deeds. He was mindful of that. David prayed to the Lord, take not thy Holy Spirit from me, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. And uh, so in the Old Testament, eternal security wasn't a guaranteed thing. You had to remain righteous up until death, according to Ezekiel 18, verse 24. And if you failed at that, you would die among the unrighteous. And all the good, all the righteousness you had done before will have, would have been forgotten. But not so when you receive the righteousness uh, that is from and of the Lord Jesus Christ. His righteousness covers me. So when God sees me, he no longer sees me guilty of whatever sins uh, might have corrupted my soul before I received Jesus Christ as my Savior. He now sees me clothed in the perfect righteousness of his Son. And uh, if, if salvation or keeping your salvation depends upon your good works, your good actions in some way, then you are not fully trusting in the grace of Jesus Christ. You're trusting in most of the way, and you still think there's something I have to do. That's the Mormon view. That's the Mormon view. I got a book down in my office called By Grace Are You, By Grace Are You Saved, and then the subtitle, uh, the, the Salvation, something like that, of God's grace in addition to what you can do. The Mormon view is that you and God, or you and Christ, are partners to uh, earn your salvation, which is a lot of hooey. But verse 11 asks, why is the house of God forsaken? The building is not the house of God. It never was the house of God. God asks, heaven is my throne, earth is my footstool. What house will you build me? Acts 7, verse 49. The congregation or the assembly, the gathering, the group of people who gather in the name of Christ, the group, the people, they are the house of God. And as far as that goes, that can be done outside, that can be done indoors. If you're lucky to have a building, you can do it indoors. The building is just the meeting place, the, the central place everyone gathers at, because I don't have enough room to put you in my living room. Or uh, and you probably don't have enough room for all of us to come to your living room. So, but we're privileged to have a building as a meeting place to, to serve the Lord and pray together and sing together and study the word of God together. But the building is not the house of God. The people are. Collectively, they make up the house of God. They are the church. They are the body of Christ. They are the bride of Jesus Christ. And uh, verses 10 and 11. Let me read those two verses again. And I perceived that the portions of the Levites had not been given them, for the Levites and the singers that did the work were fled, every one to his field. Then contended I with the rulers and said, Why is the house of God forsaken? And I gathered them together and set them in their place. Those verses indicate that the people were not supporting the ministry uh, financially. The Levites had to go out and be bivocational. They work at, that's what they, they, so many churches want of their pastor. We need him to also have another job during the week because we're not able to support him full time. And uh, it, it does handicap and hamstring a preacher. If, if everyone's trusting him to be their pastor, to be their 
shepherd, then he should have uh, freedom to give his give his energy to that and not have it divided with a, a full-time job and then squeeze, make it over to the church on time um, every Sunday morning or every Sunday night or Wednesday night or whenever the meetings are held. And some man who wants to, who knows God's led him to be a pastor. Now, not, I, I grant you, I understand it's not always possible. But ideally, he should be able to give his 100% devotion to the work of the Lord, to minister to people, make hospital calls, witness to people when he gets on the subject with them, pass out tracts during the day if people are else or other people at jobs. They don't have the freedom, the liberty, the movement that he might have. But, but it's, it's worth supporting him in that, in that work. Let me run you to a few texts, and then we'll be finished for this evening. Go forward to the New Testament. Paul, the Apostle Paul talks about much of this. Go to 1 Corinthians 9. 1 Corinthians 9. And uh, <coughs> verse 11, he says, If we have sown unto you spiritual things, is it a great thing if we shall reap your carnal things? Those are things having to do with daily life, daily provisions. Uh, keep your finger here and go back to Romans chapter 15. Romans 15 and verse 27. Romans 15, verse 27. It hath pleased them verily, and their debtors they are. For if the Gentiles have been made partakers of their spiritual things, their duty is also to minister unto them in carnal things. The, the Gentiles were, in effect, debtors to the Jews, and the Jewish apostles and disciples who ended up preaching uh, wherever God led them. And the Gentiles got in on the offer of salvation and forgiveness as well. Um, go back to 1 Corinthians 9. And verses 13 and 14. Do you not know that they which minister about holy things live of the things of the temple? And they which wait at the altar are partakers with the altar. Even so hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. And Philippians chapter 4. Philippians 4 and verse 10. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at the last your care of me um, hath flourished again, wherein ye were also careful, but ye lacked opportunity. And then jump down to verses 15 through 17. Now ye Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. For even in Thessalonica ye sent once and again unto my necessity. Not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. So, forcing, uh, forcing a pastor or a minister who you're expecting full-time commitment from, but he's not able to give full-time commitment because he's committed to something else. Um, that's, not the, that's not the ideal model in the New Testament. Of course, there are a lot of preachers and ministers out there that uh, only see if I can get a big, 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 big crowd, some mega church, then I'll have a mega income, a mega salary. I can, they're in it for the wrong reasons. But still, everyone needs to eat. Everyone needs to pay their, have their bills, get their bills paid and be able to take care of that and so forth. Um, but Paul, or uh, Nehemiah was upset because the Levites were not being fully supported by the people so that they could give their 100% attention to the sacrifice and the offerings in the temple. They were only having to go out and work in their own fields and do their own farming because the people weren't bringing the crops in as tithes to feed the priests. 